everything we're online. So again, welcome everybody um, for this sustainable design talk. Uh, I'm Eli Zawi. I run the Smart Citizens Program, which is part of the IME Flower Project and uh, based at Fab Lab Plymouth, at Plymouth College of Arts. Uh, today I'll be facilitating uh, this talk and in addition to uh, the different events and training that we have been delivering uh, around digital design and digital fabrication, we also have this uh, sustainable design initiative, uh, which includes a series of talk uh, showcasing sustainable and innovative design and manufacturing practices uh, by businesses, researchers, makers and artists. Um, so. This is our fourth uh, sustainable design talk this year. Um, earlier, at the beginning of the year, we talked about material ethics and making objects following uh, circular economy principles. Uh, we also heard from the Italian company Wasp uh, 3D printing eco homes with local clay. And last month, uh, we learned about ways of making glass using waste material, waste glass, um, with the Upcycle Glass Project, which has just launched uh, locally on, on Dartmoor. Um, so today, I am very honoured uh, to be joined by our speaker, David Baker. Uh, so David is an associate professor at the University of Hong Kong in the School of Biological Science and Swire Institute of Marine Science. Um, he's also a co-founder and chief scientist at the startup Archie Reef. So the context uh, for this talk is the decline in uh, coral and sea life populations across the globe. And uh, today we will discover how marine scientists, together with architects from the University of Hong Kong, have combined digital fabrication and the latest marine research to create artificial seabeds using 3D printed um, tiles in using terracotta. So this will be a, a really good opportunity to explore how similar uh, innovations can be implemented uh, in Plymouth, uh, in Plymouth Sounds, uh, supporting um, our marine biodiversity and, and really bringing together uh, marine scientists and digital makers. Um, so the format for this talk is pretty simple. Uh, David will be presenting for the next uh, 45 minutes or so. Uh, then we'll take a, a five minute break and come back in the space for the Q&A session until uh, half past one um, UK time. Um, so, uh, so yeah, I think that's uh, pretty much it for the intro. I'll ask uh, David to uh, take over from here. Great, thank you so much. Thank you for the invitation. Thanks everyone for spending your free time with us today, whether it be over lunch or tea or dinner. Um, it's eight o'clock here in Hong Kong. So uh, the witching hour for my children who might be screaming in the background and I apologize for that, but it won't last too long. Um, I'm here, yeah, to talk about really a nexus between design, art, science and environment. And it sounds like I'm uh, a, a little bit different from this talks that you've had more recently. And, and so I'll try to talk to you a little bit about the science side of, of how we're using design to re-engineer ocean ecosystems. And, and to dovetail with what's, what was just said, um, exploring Plymouth is something that I would say is, uh, is a perfect um, opportunity for you in this sphere because Plymouth University has led some of this ecological engineering and you can check out Plymouth University's Eco Engineering Unit, um, which inspires a lot of what we do uh, in the subtitle zone. And we'll talk more about that in the coming slides. So first of all, we have to think about nature and nature's design. Um, and by that, I mean the complexity of ecosystems and the habitats they form. Here we have a coral reef. This was uh, a beautiful reef in Micronesia. And what you can look at here is an incredibly complex seascape. Essentially, corals are what we would call foundational species. They're, they're ecosystem engineers. They're building underwater cities that are populated by 
thousands and thousands of species, millions of species globally. And that makes coral reefs a very special habitat. They represent just 0.1% of the global ocean surface, but they provide tremendous value in terms of coastal protection, fisheries and tourism, and generating a tremendous amount of wealth for humanity, much of which is yet to be discovered in the form of, of pharmaceuticals and other natural products that could have really important health benefits for us. So it's really urgent that we preserve these habitats in the coming years, especially as climate change uh, threatens to undermine it all. But what's really special about coral reefs is their ability to facilitate biodiversity. And they do that primarily by their structural complexity. And the term that we use in the scientific community is rugosity. Um, in architecture, you might call it facade, but really we're, these words are, are referring to the structural complexity of the seascape. Rugosity is really a measure of surface roughness, and it's achieved on a coral reef by the diverse forms of colonies that the corals form in their calcium carbonate skeletons. And on a reef, that rugosity is really important for several reasons. Number one, it dissipates wave energy. So that means that reefs are sort of a nature-based solution for coastal fortifications, particularly in the tropical zones where we get proper reef formation. And they also create friction as the water mass moves across it. So this can, again, dissipate wave energy. Uh, it can also facilitate this, the process of sedimentation where particles are deposited to the seabed. And this can have important roles for fisheries production, even carbon sequestration. The second benefit from reef rugosity is having more habitat. So the more reef you have, the more complex that you, you have it, it's kind of like having an apartment building with different types of flats, from studios to three bedrooms. You can, a, a diverse housing community for humanity can also lead to a diverse consortium of people that live there. So we can get greater biomass and greater biodiversity within complex reef ecosystems. Rugosity is measurable. And I, I say on this slide from chains to lasers because the simplest way to measure rugosity is to simply drop a chain or a heavy rope on the reef surface and let that chain uh, rest into all the crevices of the reef and you can simply calculate the distance of the, the length of the line that's lost by how much, how complex it is. That would be the most rudimentary way of doing it. But nowadays we have a lot of technology that comes to bear on measuring reef rugosity, including photogrammetry. So now scientists are, are taking high resolution images of reefs and stitching them together to create three dimensional models. Um, they're also using remote sensing or near earth sensing using LIDAR, for instance, which can map the surface of the seabed in clear tropical waters. So measuring rugosity is something that's becoming increasingly uh, important in science, especially as our new technologies aid us in making those estimates. And it comes at the perfect time because nowadays most of humanity lives near a coast. And many of those people are, are therefore vulnerable to things like sea level rise due to climate change. In this image from Nature Communications, you can see the, the map of our planet and the countries that are colored um, are indicating where there are, are large human populations that are at risk of climate change related damage to coastal habitats. So we're talking about increased flooding, we're talking about increased damage from storm surge and so forth. So there are about 200 million people that live within 50 kilometers of the coast or from a reef at, at around less than 10 meters of elevation. What that means is that increasingly there are communities on our planet that are experiencing this. Uh, this is a, a king tide in the Marshall Islands, which is essentially uh, starting to 
starting to bury the community in in the ocean. I mean, the the entire atoll of the Marshall Islands is is receding into the sea, to the point that the landscape has been poisoned by salt. It's very difficult for them to uh, grow anything through agriculture there now, and we're now seeing the first climate refugees from island nations. Uh, especially throughout the South Pacific, who have to be relocated because their homes simply don't exist anymore. Now, rugosity is also very important. In addition to dissipating wave energy and storm surge, it's as creating habitat space. And science shows us this is very, very clear. In this figure, you're looking at the abundance of fish, especially parrotfish, which are also critically important for the health of coral reefs. These are you can think of them as the the buffalo of the reef. They're they're grazing on algae and other types of um, of food sources that are competitors with corals. So the more parrotfish you have, the less algae you have, and therefore you have healthier coral communities. Parrotfish can also be eaten, unfortunately, and reefs that have higher rugosity also have a higher biomass of fish. They're simply more habitat for them, more grazing area, and therefore the ecosystem can have a higher carrying capacity. So the concept of reef rugosity is really quite clear. And unfortunately, the trajectory for reef rugosity is terribly poor. And I'm sure that most of you are aware that reefs globally are under severe stress. And this uh, figure on the left is showing you the coral cover. So how much of the sea floor is covered by corals? And this is specific to the Caribbean Sea, but these trends are global. Um, so the coral cover in the Caribbean could have been as high as 60% in some localities, even in the 1970s. But as we move into modern times, we can see that we're well below 20%. And in fact, a more reasonable um, uh, average for the entire Caribbean Sea is around 5% only. So the corals are essentially being wiped out slowly owing to a number of factors, but climate change being the most pr predominant. And the figure here on the right is showing you five different categories of reef rugosity that, that can be extrapolated from the colors. So white is, is no complexity and black is high complexity. So from this image, you can see that in the 1970s, we still had some diversity of rugosity across the reefs, and we had some proportion of reefs that were very complex, but those complex reefs are almost all gone. What this means is that the reef has really been flattened, and this historical image shows you what a Caribbean coral reef would have looked like when my PhD supervisor was, was young and doing her dissertation work. Uh, and I've heard stories about how in those days, a diver could swim into the coral reef, like you could swim through these corals like you were walking through a forest. And that sort of magnificent mental image for me is all that it will be. It's just a fantasy because nothing like this exists today. And in fact, I spent part of my PhD working on sites where the skeletons of these corals could be seen laying down on the seafloor. Some of them um, literally as big as a tree. Um, I, you, you can barely wrap your hands around them, but no living examples of those corals exist today. And that all happened uh, almost in the blink of an eye. So this is the type of reef that I did my PhD research on. This is a typical reefscape in the Caribbean. And what you'll notice is that there isn't much complexity anymore. There are small rocky outcrops of, of uh, ancient carbonate from the old reef, there are some resilient corals down there that are hanging on by a thread, but mostly the reef has been uh, dominated by marine sponges and soft corals, things that are doing quite well in this era of human impacts. Uh, you also note that the gill net, or the ghost net left there, and there's absolutely no fish. There's no fish in this entire image. And that's pretty typical for, for what I experienced in my early career. This is really a flattening of coral reefs. And based on what you already have learned, with no rugosity, there's no habitat for other species to survive. And the grim statistic is that more than 80% of coral reefs 
have been lost uh, within the last 50 years or so. And that's not going to get better based on our climate change predictions. Nowadays, we can kind of see all this playing out in real time um, and very exciting global initiatives like the Catlin Seaview Survey are giving us a window into even the most remote reefs on our planet. And they're able to make these very striking comparisons from similar habitats or even the same reefscape. We can see it before and after major perturbations have taken place. Um, here's another example from American Samoa where time series images, this is, this is a, a plot that's been stitched together. It's the same reef from three different snapshots showing a healthy reef in December of 2014, a, a reef that's still alive but completely bleached. So the water has gotten so warm that the corals have lost their symbiotic algae. And without their algae, they die. So by August of 2015, the reef was dead. And I'm sure soon thereafter, nature continues the process of bioerosion, where which is the deconstruction of the reef. And over a substantial period of time, all that will be left is rubble and sand. In the Great Barrier Reef, even more grim statistics. Uh, and in 2016, there was a severe coral bleaching event, and there's been several since then. But just in one year, the statistics are shocking. 67% of the reef can die in certain areas. There's more resilience in cooler waters, as you can see in the south. So there is some hope that parts of the Great Barrier Reef and parts of subtropical regions, like where I live in Hong Kong, might be spared from climate change, at least in the coming decades. But we should anticipate catastrophic losses in places like North Queensland, which are already quite hot as it is. So this brings up this concept of coral restoration. And I have to confess, even within the scientific community, there's a heck of a lot of debate on whether or not we should be bothering to save coral reefs through active management. The arguments there is that if we took all of the resources that were being put into coral reef restoration and instead applied them to lobbying governments to do something about climate change, then maybe that's money better well spent. And I have to confess that I have personally struggled with this ethical quandary uh, because I've seen firsthand what coral restoration can do. And in places like where I am here in Hong Kong, I feel quite confident that we can make a difference and at least we can, we can enhance marine ecosystems for a bit of time to try to facilitate their longevity in the future. So for instance, on the coast of China where I am, Hong Kong is really just a stepping stone for corals to migrate northward up the Chinese coast. We're seeing things like this happening in Japan and even on the Korean peninsula, um, as well as Australia for that matter. So the poleward migration of corals as they as they are moving away, and of course a coral can't get up and walk, but through reproduction, their populations can shift into a more poleward direction, um, then perhaps restoration has a really important role to play to make sure that those nodes on that highway to cooler waters are healthy and a suitable habitat for them. There are some great examples of coral restoration around the world, Fragments of Hope, is an organization that works in Belize. And they have had tremendous success focusing on endangered staghorn corals from the Caribbean, like these um, staghorn and elkhorn corals that you can see in this image. And they've been able to create reefs um, using thousands of corals that have been outplanted into suitable environmental conditions. And they, they do a great job with their media. They have fantastic images. But even Fragments of Hope is at the mercy of nature. And they suffer setbacks from coral bleaching, from coral disease, from predation and competition. So anybody who's a practitioner of ecosystem restoration, and I mean that in a very broad sense, they have to accept the risk of natural hazards, strong storms, bleaching, and so forth. They're going to undermine success, but it doesn't mean that we should be discouraged. And certainly Fragments of Hope 
is a good example of how persistence pays off. And they've been able to show that some of their corals have reached a maturity where they're now sexually reproductive. And that's the ultimate goal. If you can allow a coral to get to an adult size, it can start to create new corals that can settle out all around on the reef. There is another great example from Ken Nettemeyer in the Florida Keys, who with the support of a lot of other stakeholders has been uh, a champion for coral restoration in that area. And Ken takes a different approach. He works in the Gulf Stream further offshore of the Florida Keys where the water is absolutely pristine as you can see in this image, but there isn't any suitable hard bottom. So Ken is here holding his corals up, but it's a big field of sand there. And so what Ken has had to do is, is lay down a new foundation or a new framework for those corals to be attached to, to be hanging from these uh, floating hanger systems and also uh, attached to the seabed. The idea here is that out in those ideal conditions, researchers can identify corals that have certain attributes that are desirable. They maybe they grow really fast or maybe they have some additional resistance to thermal stress. Um, and like all cases, you know, we're at the mercy of nature. So when they bring those corals back to the reef proper and plant them, they have to keep a careful eye on them to see which corals are able to survive the more difficult conditions because the, the, the reef proper is much closer to human development and all the bad things that come with it, including sewage pollution and so on. So it's, it's almost a, a never ending struggle to try through trial and error to identify specific corals. And I'm talking about genetic combinations or genetic variants of corals that are more resilient to our current and future conditions. So taking, taking uh, from these examples, we can come up with a few different questions that we need to answer before we undertake coral restoration. The first is, what is our conservation target? What are we trying to achieve? And to understand that, we might think about what was the historical species composition of our coral reef? What would we like to bring back? And the, the analogy I often use is that it's often like, this is rewilding in a sense. And you know, in the UK, there's fantastic examples of rewilding from the US where I'm from, we think of the reintroduction of wolves into Yellowstone National Park. So those types of interventions are based on solid scientific evidence that having certain species within the community is vital to the overall health of the ecosystem. And the same holds true for even benthic uh, communities in the ocean. And with respect to coral reefs, if we have a target in mind of what we want to achieve, then that helps to inform our restoration practices. So now I'll go off on a little tangent and tell you a little bit about my local environment in Hong Kong. We have a rich maritime history. Um, this is a grainy image of Victoria Harbor, which now um, is unrecognizable because it's filled with skyscrapers. But here we have Victoria Harbor uh, in the probably mid 1800s, which uh, is characterized, you know, it's the age of sail. So you could see that uh, these sailing vessels are there uh, as part of the nascent uh, international trade that we're now well known for. And the other thing that's pretty interesting is that you'll notice that the landscape behind those ships, there aren't many settlements there, but there are also no trees. And there's something significant about that. There are historical records of what the environment was like. And this is a image of William Stimson, who was an American um, natural historian, who was part of, one of the US first um, exploring expedition through the Pacific. And Stimson's collections and notes were used as the foundation for what was to become the Smithsonian Institution. And in April 28th, 1854, Stimson wrote that he went into Victoria Harbor further than he had ever been before. And Stimson also writes about how he was being chased around by pirates at that time. 
And he noticed that there was a, a place within the harbor that he called Coral Bay. And he found a considerable variety of corals. Most of these taxonomic names are no longer relevant. Many of a large size and attached to the boulders below the low water mark. And in his journal, he included this map and Stimson was a remarkable cartographer because this lines up pretty well to Google Earth. But you'll notice on the map just above the Hong of Hong Kong, you'll see where he marked Coral Bay in 1854. And so this is the Google Earth image. And Google uh, Coral Bay is what is today called Chai Wan. And in Cantonese, Chai Wan stands for Firewood Bay. Firewood is the significant thing here because most of Hong Kong had been completely deforested multiple times for firewood. And the, the wood was being used as fuel for what was Hong Kong's first major industrial activity, which was burning corals and oyster shells to make slaked lime for construction and agriculture and so forth. Nowadays, there aren't any reef building corals in Victoria Harbor. And most of what Stimson reported as Coral Bay has been buried by reclamation. Nowadays, there are patterns that suggest that humanity has been very bad for coral reefs in Hong Kong. And in this image, you can see places where living staghorn corals are found. So. In Asia, we also have staghorn corals, just like the Caribbean does. But just like the Caribbean, they're very sensitive species that tend to be the first to disappear when human beings come around. So you can think of them as a canary in the coal mine. And from this image, the red dots are showing you wherever my team has found living staghorn corals. And in the black circles, those are places where we have found the fragments of staghorn coral skeletons. So the evidence that staghorn corals used to be there, but no living representatives can be found. And what this figure is showing you is that their overall range has contracted by about 40%. And the areas where their range has contracted are concentrated around human areas. So all these embayments that you can see on the figure are places where extreme um, urban development has led to a deterioration of water quality that makes the environment inhospitable for these very sensitive corals. And again, a lot of the historical damage was done probably anywhere from a few thousand to a few hundred years ago. Uh, with the industrialization of Hong Kong and, you know, even back to the Tang and Qing dynasty, they were firing these kilns all along the coastline. So you can almost imagine uh, in your head going back in time and sailing into Hong Kong, you probably would have seen the whole coastline dotted with these fires uh, at these kiln sites, many of which are still preserved today. And you can go and visit them and, and you can look around the kiln and you can find the scattered remnants of all the corals that they were harvesting, even live corals, they were burning them because the, the calcium carbonate skeleton of the coral was seen as a very high quality and a high value lime that was produced from it. And if we dig through those fragments, well, in addition to doing some archeological digs, we find a lot of cool stuff. So there are uh, middens where people left all their rubbish from their meals uh, and we can find turtle shells. We can find the ribs of dugongs. There are historical records from the um, colonial newspapers that talk about megafauna, whales and shark attacks and all kinds of stuff. I mean, it was a really wild place, much wilder than it is now. But it, in a more calm setting, the corals were also somewhat different. And these are just a few fragments that can be picked up from the kiln sites and we see entire genera of, of uh, corals like the euphelia you see there in the center. This, this genus can't be found in Hong Kong today. So there's evidence of extirpation or the total elimination of species from our local waters. 
I, I once even went to an archaeological dig on an island called Chung Chow, which is, in fact, it's one of the most remarkable Neolithic sites in all of China because it's been inhabited for so long, many thousands of years. And uh, by government uh, ordinance, if there's any house redevelopment there, the, the government has to go in and do an archaeological investigation. So they're typically looking for human artifacts. But in this case, there was a young archaeologist who had just graduated from Oxford who gave me a call and said, Dr. Baker, we're, we're digging under this house and all we're finding all these corals. And I want to know, is this, is this special or is it meaningful? And remarkably, when I got to the site, uh, I left immediately and went there. When I got there, I found that they had even they had even archived the the samples by their stratigraphy. So this these were the specimens they had from the deepest or the oldest layers of what was a, a, a fossil beach. And here you can see large chunks of corals. They're mostly intact. You can see branching species and boulder species, and shells of different types of marine gastropods and bivalves that are typical of coral reef communities. And then if you move up a layer, uh, you'll see a transition that's starting to happen. The corals aren't as robust. There aren't any branching corals anymore. And you can also see they're, they're pockmarked and have holes in them. There's evidence that there's more bioerosion in that ancient ecosystem. You also notice that there are different clam shells. And some of these clams are more common to estuarine environments, to river systems. And then as we move into the most modern layer, we find that the corals are basically gone. And we have done some radiocarbon dating of, of samples from similar locations and found that a lot of this transition happened about 3,000 years ago with the, with the growth of rice cultivation in Guangdong province. So even back then, humans were changing the landscape clear-cutting forests, destabilizing soils, and increasing the uh, runoff into the ocean environment that had a downstream effect on Hong Kong's coral reefs. So we need to know that history because it's really important for informing our present and, and our future, especially when we want to intervene. The second major question that we have to answer is, is the environment suitable for restoration? And this is where a lot of people get it wrong. Uh, there's a lot of interest in coral restoration now. There's a lot of good-hearted people who, you know, their heart's in the right place, but they're a bit misguided with their resources and their plans. You can't just build a coral reef anywhere. You have to know that you have good water quality. And so most of my research has focused on understanding the water quality around Hong Kong. And this image is uh, simplifying that for you. So we've created a model that compiles a lot of different water quality parameters, things that you might be familiar with like temperature and oxygen concentration, uh, sedimentation, pH, nutrient concentrations, and so forth. And when you put them all together and you compare those data with where we find corals in a healthy state and where we don't find corals at all, this map represents that. So the blue areas are, are where corals should be able to survive and thrive. And the red areas and yellow areas are basically no coral areas. And this is using data from 2005 to 2009, which is remarkably readily available from the local government. And we decided that since these conditions look pretty good in the East for corals, we thought maybe we would try to reintroduce staghorn corals in this uh, area, which we call Tolo Harbor. And so what you're seeing here are, are three different sites along Tolo Harbor. The first one is called Center Island, and it's surrounded by some of the densest urban populations you can ever imagine. It's kind of a surreal feeling to be diving there and to surface and just be looking at the housing of probably uh, a two million people or something like that. Uh, then there's uh, Chele Pai, which is a small little rocky outcrop in the middle of Tolo Channel. And then far outside of the harbor is a place called Port Island. And so when I was uh, first started at the university, my students were quite eager and they wanted to, um, they wanted to experiment with coral transplantation. They wanted to move corals 
into areas where they hadn't existed before. And I told them this was a terrible idea. You're just going to torture the poor corals and kill them. But I let them do it. And I was, rem I was astonished by the results. So not surprisingly, at Center Island, all the corals died within a few months. But at Chele Pai and Tung Ping Chow, or uh, Port Island, where there are no staghorn corals, the corals that we place there not only survived, all of them survived, but they thrived. And in fact, at Port Island, uh, they, they grew by more than a thousand percent in about a 13 month time frame. And it's probably better to show you what that looks like. So this is how we started. And I've, I've since realized that this was the first iteration of our reef tile. So this is a concrete slab that was cast in an aluminum foil mold. And my students cut off the tops of PET bottles and sunk them into the wet concrete and then uh, made a little uh, system whereby you can detach the corals from that concrete plate so that we can make measurements of their, their growth. Um, so this is what they look like when they went into the water. The, the fragment of coral is probably as big as one of your fingers. And then after four months, they started to branch. Everybody's looking very healthy. By nine months, uh, you can see the growth is, is increasing. And then after 13 months, some of them had gotten so heavy that the, the metal thread that we had attached them to was starting to bend over. So when I saw this, I thought, wow, you know, it really changed my whole perspective on what coral restoration looks like and what we can achieve defying all of my expectations. So all credit to my, to my students for being diligent there. So taken, what we take away from that is that the habitat now in Hong Kong is becoming more suitable for corals and therefore it's worthwhile to invest some time in considering their more widespread redistribution. But we also need to make sure that if we put our time and money into restoration, we need to make sure that it, that, that site is protected from other stressors. And there are heaps of stressors in the ocean, not the least of which is the uh, haphazard anchoring of uh, small vessels, especially from fishermen who often congregate around our reef communities. So, you know, a single anchor can do a tremendous amount of damage. So luckily we work alongside of our, our local government who has uh, through a great deal of effort worked with our local maritime communities, especially the fishing community to identify sites where, where fishermen really shouldn't be anchoring. And uh, they've established these no anchor areas and they are patrolled by the agriculture, fisheries and conservation department. And therefore we can work within those boundaries uh, and have some reasonable insurance that these sites are not going to be terribly disturbed by other types of activities. And this is something that I think is fairly rare. It's very rare globally to have that kind of um, stakeholder engagement and the, you know, the tacit permission that we get from the government to work in some of these sites. One of those sites is very special and it's the Hoi Ha Wan Marine Park. And Hoi Ha Wan is actually, I think, the, one of the only places in Hong Kong where you can access it by public transportation. You can rent a snorkeling set from a local vendor and you can jump off the fishing pier onto a pretty nice coral reef. Um, and the entire area is a marine park, but in Hong Kong, a marine park means that it's for recreation. So fishing is allowed in the marine park, at least for now. Um, and there are a number of interesting coral communities within the marine park. And here I'm identifying a few that are relevant to the story I'm telling today. It, Hoi Ha Wan was a remarkable jewel of Hong Kong's marine biodiversity. And I reached out to some uh, photographers who used to work here back in the day. Uh, Michael Pitts is one in particular who did even some documentary filming of the habitats of Hoi Ha Wan. And you can see this coral reef here, a couple of different species, lots of rugosity. It looks pretty cool. Um, I haven't seen anything like that in Hong Kong today. This is what I dive on. This is, these are the same corals. This is a platygyra or a brain coral. 
but you'll notice that it's not looking very good. Um, and part of the problem here is that we have harmful algal blooms that these corals feed on and it's toxic to the corals so it kills their tissues and that impedes their growth. We also have tremendous rates of bioerosion and in the, in the lower left-hand corner you can see the spines of very active long spine sea urchins that are constantly grazing away at the internal skeleton of the coral to try to extract the algae and the other in, in, invertebrates that live inside. And unfortunately with that weakened condition when we have a strong storm, which we often do, uh, the whole colony can topple over. And you know now it looks more like a mushroom that's fallen on its top. And you can see those urchins will continue to do the job until the whole thing is ground down into sand. So the problem that we have now is that these different environmental factors climate exacerbated by climate change and pollution are undermining the resilience of our coral reefs. So we were asked to intervene and try to do something to mitigate the losses of corals. And unfortunately, these platygyra corals, which once were the dominant coral in Hoi Ha Wan Marine Park, um, suffered something like 90% losses. And it was tragic because if you were a diver, you would have remembered that some of these coral colonies were, they could be two meters in height, they could be several meters in circumference. So these weren't small structures, they were really, really large and contributed a great deal to the habitat complexity of our coral communities. So we intervened and using very rudimentary methods, we established nurseries in the marine park. And this is what they look like. They're just plastic mesh over PVC. And here we would use these nurseries as a staging ground. So we're, we're salvaging corals that have been toppled over. We would chisel them down to remove any of the weak skeleton, to remove the fouling organisms, and try to get a nice clean piece of healthy coral tissue that we would then attach to the nursery frame. And the, the nurseries are important, as you saw Ken Nettemeyer's work. Nurseries are really important because they keep the corals away from the sand. Sand is abrasive. During a storm, it's like sandblasting. And corals have a very thin skin, a very thin veneer of tissue on their surface that is very sensitive to that type of abrasion, especially when they're small. So the nursery gives the corals some reprieve from the sand. It also it, gets them away from some of those uh, grazing urchins and allows them to heal up from their fragmentation. So once they were fragmented, we would move them to natural substrates. But we still encountered a problem. So here we show the survivorship of those corals in orange. Uh, so starting with 100% survivorship, we noticed that in, in both sites where we were working, that thing, the trajectory was negative, you know, even after uh, we're within a year, we would lose uh, maybe 15% of the fragments. And the primary reason for that loss was detachment. We were trying to utilize a technique that's called micro colony fusion. Um, the, the, the best analogy is that this is like um, how a surgeon might repair a burn victim's skin by grafting healthy pieces of skin onto the wound and allowing them to kind of stitch themselves together in a mosaic pattern to kind of restore the, the skin to some state of functionality. And this works as well for corals. So here, this is work from uh, uh, David Vaughn from the Moat Marine Lab in Florida, which, which established the, the, the name for this technique. And from left to right, you can see how small fragments of corals, they can grow quite quickly and eventually they will fuse together when they are sourced from the same parent coral. So that means if, they're, if their genetics are the sim similar, when the colonies touch, they will recognize themselves as self and they will reattach. So this will give the corals a faster way of connecting to each other. So we tried this and it works, but it wasn't very elegant. And we also struggled with detachment because when you're trying to epoxy a coral to a boulder, uh, the, the fouling, uh, the algae and the fouling that's on the, the biofilm of the boulder eventually will detach from the epoxy. You really need the corals to attach themselves 
to that substrate. So we needed to come up with a better solution. But here is the big problem, and this is how we'll get into the 3D printing thing. You can't build a reef without hard bottom. And so I've been inspired by so many people all over the planet, um, including Peter Todd from the National University of Singapore, who started working on these um, 3D design structures that are meant to enhance marine biodiversity. And that got me thinking, there must be other applications. In Plymouth, for example, the Marine Eco Engineering Unit has established these bio blocks, which are meant to enhance the intertidal zone by creating new habitat space, new complexity for organisms to occupy. So this really inspired me and I started thinking about, well, what if we started to tile the seabed instead of using these flimsy plastic nurseries? What if we put something more robust and permanent down there? And we used the similar types of ideas to modify the surface of those tiles to create new habitat, kind of like you would be tiling your kitchen or bathroom floor. And so over time, uh, I actually hired a, a very talented um, computer assisted design guru who helped to render some of these early images. And over time, it got better and better and better. And I started to think, well, how cool would this be if we can use additive manufacturing or this fabrication to create complex artificial structures that can be used to enhance the foundational species success. And so now we're thinking about in our science, we're talking about manipulating complexity to see how it affects biodiversity and the functioning of those marine communities. The idea of tiling, also, I also started thinking about, well, how can these things work together? And we, we settled on a hexagonal design that would allow for interlocking of the tiles. We also decided on a modular design. So each tile is about 0.6 meters in diameter. And this is sufficient for a single diver to handle. They weigh about 10 to 15 kilograms. So they're modular, they can be moved with a single diver. And then we started to tinker around with biomimicry. So one of the problems that we have in Hong Kong is sedimentation. And the platygyra coral is the king of dealing with sedimentation. Because of the way its polyps are structured, it's able to kind of move those sediments off of the surface. So we wanted to make sure that our tiles were going to be immune from sedimentation. So we copied the design of the surface of platygyra and incorporated that into our, uh, our designs. There's a lot of cool stuff going on with 3D printing and 3D imaging of corals that you can even download all of these cool models, digital models that can be printed on a 3D printer. We've even tinkered around with that, doing CT scans and 3D models of staghorn corals, even printing them in plastic uh, as a, a model for some demonstration purposes. So there's a whole wealth of information now out there at this nexus of design and the functional, functional complexity of coral reefs. A lot of companies are now doing these plug and play tiles, which is very relevant. Anything that can help enhance the efficiency of a diver working underwater. We've also had to think about solutions for attaching them to the seabed in a way that is easy to remove, but also provides a great deal of stability, especially when there are anchors flying around. So the reef tile slowly developed over time. Uh, these prototypes uh, or these designs eventually were turned into prototypes. So when you put in a reef tile, like, well, how do you measure performance? The, the health uh, and the growth rate of the coral is just one element. And the real question, linking back to the title is, if you build it, will they come? So what I'm really interested in is how do these reef tiles help us create a new coral reef? And how does other types of life move into those that new habitat? You know, really, what is the evolution of a reef? What is the succession of a reef? And I'm not talking about corals at all. I'm talking about the inhabitants of coral reefs, which are primarily small, microscopic invertebrates, primarily arthropods, crabs, and shrimp, and, and all kinds of funny looking worms. Uh, these are the organisms that really make the world go round. They are responsible for a, a great deal of the ecosystem functioning that human beings benefit from. 
the, not the least of which is uh, they're the foundation of the food web. They are the ultimate food source that feeds all of the fisheries that end up on our plates. So to capture that diversity, we use these PVC condominiums. This is a, called an autonomous reef monitoring structure. It's a standardized passive sampler for marine biodiversity. There are about 3,000 of these in the water all over the world, and we have quite a few of them here in Hong Kong through a program that I run called Marine Geo. And I can show you what these arms look like. If you deploy them for a, a year or two, you can see the successional process of marine communities. Um, so this is along a water quality gradient from left to right, bad water quality on the left, good water quality on the right. And you can see visually, they're entirely different marine communities. On the left, we have tube worms and suspension feeders, like these big tunicates, sea squirts. And on the right, we have less biomass. We have more crustose coral and algae and things that do better in clear, clean water. So processing these arms is really a heck of a lot of work. It takes 120 person hours to process each one. And what we do is we take all the things that we can see and we try to identify them as best as we can using a network of, our, of the world's best marine taxonomists. And then everything that we can't figure out, we, we use DNA barcoding to try to figure out if we can identify it. And then we can use eDNA metabarcoding. This is the process by which you extract DNA from the environment and sequence it to create a list of species uh, from that, that are living there. And here are some high resolution images of those. We also measure benthic cover from the tiles. We take high resolution images so we can see how marine life is attaching to those. So the integration of these measurements uh, allows us to provide a lot of data that can tell us how the reef tiles are functioning, not in terms of biodiversity and also in terms of biomass, which is what you're seeing here. So the reef tiles kept being refined. We decided that we were going to create a docking station for an arms so we can blend these two technologies together so that we can sample or detach the arms over time from the reef tile to see how it's performing. And then we, we partnered with architects who had this incredible fabrication lab that could print in terracotta. Terracotta is a fantastic material for biocompatibility. For hundreds of years, scientists have used terracotta tiles to understand what marine life is out in the ocean. So this is our current reef tile that's based on biomimicry. And the remarkable thing is that it works really well. I'm actually kind of surprised to say that. Um, because it's not just about the gimmick of 3D printing, it's about creating something that is fit for purpose and scalable. So here you can see on the right, we even have a mini tile that could be deployed even in my home aquarium. Uh, but now our science is focused on trying to look at the biocompatibility between the reef tile and multiple species of corals and how those multiple species in an assemblage facilitate the recruitment of other marine organisms. So here you can see our reef tiles deployed in the Hoi Hawan Marine Park. And it, it may be surprising or not surprising that they quickly become completely covered with life. Uh, particularly bivalves like to settle in all the nooks and crannies. But since we seed them with corals first, the corals have a good chance of growth and survivorship. And here you, you on the right or left-hand side, you can see that a cuttlefish even finds our reef tiles suitable as habitat for laying her eggs. On the right-hand side, you can see evidence of corals that are attaching. The terracotta is really suitable for this, but we do recognize that terracotta has a carbon footprint associated with firing them in the kiln. So we, we aim to work on that in the future. So we attach the tiles in a, a sort of a modular format, and you can see the arms integrated into the middle of them. And this is pretty much what they look like right now. Um, you can see the corals growing. It looks a lot like those 3D renders that we started with. And ultimately, we hope we get to something like this, where the tile isn't even really noticed anymore. Uh, the tile is meant to be just the foundation upon which a new coral reef will begin. So Archie Reef today uh, is a company, a spin-off company from HKU, from this collaborative effort with architecture and science. And 3D printing gives us the ability to 
adapt these tiles for any purpose. And now we're even brainstorming uh, ideas for enhancing eco shoreline uh, research, which is something that Plymouth is doing quite well. And we're thinking about adapting products for even blue carbon ecosystem restoration like mangroves and seagrasses. All, all of this is due to a remarkable student of mine, Rico Yu, who is the CEO of Arky Reef. And um, through her determination, she has taken us really to the forefront of this sort of so-called green technology engineering, at least in our part of the world. So you can check out a lot of the coverage that we've had probably just from a simple Google search. Um, so with that, I would like to thank everybody for your attention and also my team at Arky Reef and at HKU. And I would be delighted to, to use the rest of the time we have together to answer any of your questions that you have about uh, what I've presented tonight. Thank you very much. Wonderful. Um, thank you, David. Uh, that was uh, such an incredible and informative uh, presentation. There was so much covered there from the sort of uh, rugosity up to uh, corals and, and the innovation with uh, with the ties that you've, you've developed uh, some staggering figures at the beginning as well uh, on, on how uh, how corals are affected across the world as well. So what we'll do uh, next is uh, take a five minute uh, break. I encourage you to think about all the questions that you may have and we'll be back uh, here here at like um, two, two, two minutes past one uh, to, to take uh, the, the questions. Uh, so um, see you see you in a few minutes. Right, so welcome back uh, everybody. Uh, I think we're gonna uh, start uh, the sort of Q&A session now. So um, I can see we've already uh, received some uh, really positive feedback uh, for you, David. Uh, and uh, and yeah, I'm going to ask uh, everybody to uh, jump in uh, if you want to ask your questions straight to David or write them on the chat, and and we'll be taking uh, taking them step by step uh, with your, your different questions. I'm just going to start with uh, Katie's question. Um, so. It was uh, a yeah, really fascinating talk uh, and uh, really important that, David, you raised uh, the issue of completing demands for financial resources. In that context, what coral reef protection and the restoration was given uh, in terms of cons consideration at the recent COP26? Do you know? Yeah, uh, unfortunately, I don't know, but I, I am a member of the International Coral Reef Society, a, a former um, council member. And I know that uh, our society has been pretty active in sending delegations to relevant meetings, including COP26. Um, that was very recent, so I haven't yet heard, there hasn't been a, a, an outcome report from the society yet, but I'm sure that's forthcoming. Um, and you might be able to check it out by uh, following the International Coral Reefs Society on Facebook which has a group that you can join um, without any strings and uh, or check out their website. They might have some updates on that very, very soon. Mm. Great question. Great, thanks, David. Um, so I'll jump in with the next one from Chloe and that is uh, a little bit more specific to, yeah. uh, to Plymouth. So could you speak a little about how this technology may support seagrass restoration? Um, yeah. I Seagrass restoration is a really interesting thing. And when I was an undergraduate, uh, I, I grew up around the Chesapeake Bay. And one of my one of my early academic advisors was working on seagrass restoration, which has been immensely successful in that part of the world, but just by brute labor, you know, manual labor. And um, so I've only been thinking out of my head what what might work and one thing that inspires me is um, uh, there's a group called Seacore, which does, um, they do sexual reproduction of corals. So they focus primarily on, on uh, sexual reproduction as a means for genetic recombination and, and, the, and trying to facilitate adaptation for corals. So this is actually uh, quite different than what we're doing. We're doing restoration by fragmentation. So that's essentially trying to save 
your existing genetic diversity, but not really adapting much. Um, now, CCOR had uh, a trial run that I, I was able to see firsthand where they were, they used 3D design, not 3D printing, but 3D design to cast small tetrapods. So, you know, a tetrapod being like a, a multi-footed structure in three dimensions that if you throw it, uh, it will always land right side up, right? And um, so the idea that came across would be, how could you adapt such a tetrapod so that uh, a seagrass frag, uh, a propagule, so like a, a shoot of seagrass with some root could be kind of deployed in mass. You could just chuck them off of a boat into a suitable habitat. So I don't really see an angle there per se for 3D printing. But mm -hmm. for having small modular structures that are perhaps 3D designed could be very useful. OK. And did you know which type of material was used uh, for this uh, modular uh, base for the for the seagrass? Oh, well, this is just a concept. Uh, if you're talking right. about the seacore structures, they were I think they were just using uh, a low cement concrete with a high limestone content trying to mitigate some of the problems with concrete, which is a very high pH uh, at the yep. boundary layer, which can be inhospitable to some marine species. Mm. OK, thank you. Um, and just jumping back on, on Katie's question, we've had a comment uh, on the chat from Pamela saying that uh, the COP26 had a new commitment to include uh, oceans in climate action. So. Um, implicitly, that means ocean recovery. Thanks for that comment, uh, Pamela. Um, and another, so we've got another question from Chloe. Uh, and again, Chloe, feel free to jump in the chat, as, uh, the, the, the call as well. Uh, but uh, yeah, uh, David, could you explore 3D printing with biomaterial in the future? Mm. Yes, this is a fantastic question. You know, in so HKU has a remarkable wealth of additive manufacturing capability. So we we kind of landed on the the large scale end of it. And, um, you know, when I found out that they were printing in terracotta, I was so impressed and I had to get in there. Um, but at the small end, we have we have some really cutting edge 3D printers that can print in stainless steel using selective laser sintering. Uh, we also have in our faculty of dentistry, we have some really cutting edge 3D printers that are being used to print dental implants with uh, using like cellular cultures from the patient. So imagine if you could print a, a, a tooth out of appetite or calcium phosphate, same material as our teeth, you could print that. And at the same time, you have another printer head that is ex extruding uh, a, a cellular cocktail derived from the patient so that the implant will bind and and really kind of naturally take to the recipient. Um, and when I saw something like that, I thought, wow, maybe we can print living corals with this, right? Yeah. You can print a, a skeleton. And, and in fact, some corals have really remarkable capabilities like the their cells are almost all like stem cells so they can differentiate uh very rapidly um mm -hmm. so you know it's not out of the realm of it's not science fiction that we might be able to do that someday it's probably outside of my scope of work but um but it certainly is exciting so um yeah we we are lucky that we have so many different types of of 3d printers that we can access which allows us to consider different types of applications so when we talk about biomaterials in particular, what I'm really in interested in right now is trying to um, develop a low cement concrete. This has been done before. There's even companies that create eco-friendly concretes. Um, but I would like to explore how we can manipulate the porosity of concretes and then infuse them with certain bioactive compounds things like uh, bio, you know, biofilms and chemical cues that might tell marine organisms like this is a great place to live and attract them to that surface to maybe speed up the pace of, of that sort of ecological enhancement. So yeah, that's a really, I think that's probably the next frontier 
uh, in this whole green tech engineering thing. Mm. Yeah, that's great to hear also about the those 3D printers uh, and, and the capacity that uh, that they have in, in, in your lab. That's, uh, that's really amazing. Um, so uh, another question from uh, Francisco, uh, who is uh, absolutely amazed by uh, the research that you're doing. Do you offer internships for <laughs> PhD students at RTU? Sure. <laughs> absolutely. If you don't mind 21 days of quarantine. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, yeah, we we Archi Reef as well as HKU. We have um, we we definitely accept accept interns uh, and volunteers. And you know, Archi Reef is expanding, so we will even be hiring in the future. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, please get in touch. Uh, anyone's welcome to get in touch. We we welcome that type of engagement. Great. Thank you. Um, so just looking at the chat, see if we've got uh, other questions. I don't think we've got any at the moment. But again, as I said, feel free to jump in the chat uh, if you want to uh, ask ask a question. I was quite interested in uh, finding out about um, the sort of sea life that we have in Plymouth Sounds because uh, I'm not from a, a sort of marine background at all, and whether we could also start exploring creating tiles or cubes uh, for uh, that uh, sea life to, to protect them and provide that habitat. Well, I think you I think you already are. And I see Nigel there has a really beautiful structure. Um, I was I was checking out your your Twitter a moment ago, Nigel. Um, so yeah, uh, it, it you know, this is something that's really kicking off all over the world, and you have, you have this amazing talent, right there uh, in Plymouth. Uh, in fact, I and I really wanted to make a point of saying that Plymouth has almost been pioneering in some of these technologies. Uh, and I, I'm trying to think about. I, I know I've met Luis I, uh, Firth from Plymouth, and I've met probably a couple of other under the individuals whose names I don't recall. But um, it, locally in Hong Kong, uh, we know Steve Hawkins very well from Southampton, who has been involved in, in the Plymouth group. And, um, and Kenny Lung, uh, who, you know, he did, a, he has a lot of roots in the UK. Um, so Kenny was the one that really came to me and was like, oh, you got to be doing something in this area. And, and Kenny even organized back when we could travel and visit with each other, he organized um, these these conferences on eco shoreline technologies where he brought architects and scientists together it was really fantastic and inspiring mm. so you know all due credit to the people who came before us i think the only thing that we have done that's been innovative is the materials um the the terracotta is a kind of a new thing and and really kind of focusing on the subtitle you know, we we have we've intentionally kind of not gone into the eco shoreline stuff so much although more recently we have been asked to come in to kind of help spice up an eco shoreline because um some of this the the designs the government is trialing here locally are also like the bio blocks which are being used in plymouth but they're not as they're not as complex um so they've asked us to kind of cover those blocks with some with extra complexity and we're now tri trialing that with the government and different types of materials. So, um, yeah, I mean, this is really, uh, it's a privilege to be working alongside a lot of these people on these cool, cool methods. Hmm. Nigel, tell us about what you have there. I'm, I'm dying to know. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thanks, David. And thanks, Elizabeth, too. It's absolutely fascinating. Uh, the, the, the coral world is quite new, new to us, but we've been working in the intertidal zone for um, well, since 2013, we first deployed some objects to, to yeah. try and, uh, you know, bring some biodiversity and bioabundance to that, that zone. I have to confess, I'm not an ecologist. I'm, my background's in the arts, but I work very closely with artists, uh, with uh, ecologists and, uh, and yeah. other scientists as well. We work with all sorts of universities across, uh, across the UK and Europe. Um, and, and this is a thing we call the vertical. So you're seeing it's on, on its side at the moment. Right. Which, this deploys onto onto sea defences that way around. You can see the the stainless steel brackets at the back. 
And the idea is, this is the smallest vertical we make. Um, uh, and the idea is that when the tide goes out, it fills with water. It's very, very simple. But there's so right. much uh, in common with what you've been talking about in terms of complexity, pattern, shape, form, texture. These are all words yeah. I use as a sculptor and have done for 30 years. And, yeah, and yeah. so, uh, you know, exploring crafts, actually, uh, as a way to um, bring that sort of much needed heterogeneity to, to eco engineering is a really interesting way of looking at it. We're, we're, we're fascinated by technology uh, yeah. of 3D printing, but we're also equally fascinated. This is a little fragment of, uh, of ceramic knitting. Okay, yeah. So this is this is knitted. I mean, it's literally knitted, uh, right. and, and then you know soaked in uh, in clay, uh, clay slip, and fired, and and so you know you can see that there are very ancient and old crafts that yes. that can be used to 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 make some very interesting three dimensional complex objects. Because the one thing that we have learned in the eight ten years that we've been doing this stuff is that complexity is everything. That's right. Uh, you know, Absolutely. Of, uh, bioreceptivity. So, you know, there's there's synergy here, David. Absolutely. Yes. yes. No, I was going to say thank you for bringing your talents to this. I've always got something on my desk. <laughs> yeah. No, because we, we, we need that. So, I mean, uh, I'll be completely honest. Scientists are often terrible designers, right? You know, and, and when with Archi Reef, especially, I'm constantly... Um, pushing our team, let, let, we need to recruit some people with, like you say, craft skills. I want to, I want to work with someone who is a ceramics expert. Exactly. Who, uh, who can well, diversify yeah. our materials and glazes yeah. and all kinds of fun stuff. Well, we're based here in the in the Isle of Wight World Biosphere Reserve. We've, we, you know, we've got that designation back in 20, 2019. and as a result, you know, we the sort of spotlight has come down on the Isle of Wight in all sorts of ways. Mm. But we've got a very, very big creative pr practitioner movement here on the island. So, I mean, I'm in my studio now, and the, and the sea is, you know, I could throw a pebble into the sea, but I'm right. also surrounded by artists and sculptors and 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 creative practitioners across the yeah. board and so you know the the influence that they bring to what we do is huge um look at the work of, of matthew chambers here on the isle of wight and just mm. have a look at the beautiful ceramics that he makes uh and then just sort of imagine one of those one of his incredible sculptures essentially you know in the sea what could it do and, and those That's are the right. kinds of questions that are you know that, that we're asking ourselves and then going to practitioners and saying you want to get involved and invariably yeah. they do you know oh fantastic well, thank, thank you, you for that yeah so um i think we've got uh juliet with a a question uh, do you want to jump in juliet hi yeah so i i've had to dip and dive out of the um excuse the pun no pun intended there out out of the talk because uh my daughter's got COVID, so um, <laughs> I'm sorry. I've, I've been uh, multitasking, but I just wanted to say thank you. I've been, um, each time I've come on, I've been hearing praise about Plymouth University, which is great. That's where I did my PhD. And uh, so I did mine on um, the environmental design of coastal structures, mainly out on Plymouth Breakwater. So on the big wave breaker concrete blocks. Um, and manipulating those to add this surface texture and heterogeneity and um so all, all yeah it's all been sounding sounds really good it's it's like a step further um and yeah steve hawkins professor hawkins was my one of my phd supervisors along with okay. richard thompson and yeah. uh, and i have since published with louise firth as well so cool um, small world right yeah yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, so Steve actually has been, I mean, he spent a lot of time in Hong Kong. And, um, yeah. and of course, our, our Marine Lab director is Gray Williams, and they go way back. And um, so, and Steve is, has served, you know, as, as a advisor to our faculty. So he's been around quite a lot. And, and when he, whenever he's been around, he's given talks. And I think the last talk I saw him give was about the bioblocks. So yeah, I mean, there's a great deal. I mean, it's science, right? There's a lot, we stand on the shoulders of giants. There's a lot of cross fertilization and that's where the innovation comes from. So yeah, I think it's really kind of cool this to, to reflect on 
the people and and the the work that's been done it's all exciting stuff yeah absolutely i think it's been great to find out about all the the existing connections and all the innovations that are uh, that are happening so yeah. i think if uh having become the uk first national marine park and i know that's still something that's been uh, sort of developed at the moment but mm. might be scope for more innovations uh locally as well which is really exciting um mm. so uh i've got a question from robin on the chat uh so uh david have you noticed any uh taxa that take the terracotta less favorably than adjacent natural habitats? Yeah, um, that's a great question. And the we don't have the data yet, but we will. Uh, and and that's what I was referring to. We're, we use this meta barcoding technique, the eDNA method. And so when, when we get to a good um, sort of threshold point, when the corals have grown quite a bit, we, we, we can sample these structures, we can scrape the biofilms off of them, we can sequence the eDNA, and then we can compare them to reference sites. So we can, I mean, we can reconstruct a species list that is at least 4,000 species that are taxonomically vouchered. So that means that there's a specimen in a museum somewhere of that organism that has been verified by a scientist. And then we have another 4,000, uh, what we would call an operational taxonomic unit. This is a, just a fancy word for saying, we don't know what the hell it is, but it's probably a unique species. So that's a total of about 8,000 individual species that we can detect with this cutting edge method. I didn't go into it too much because it's really sciencey, but, um, but that gives us this ability to just know the whole inventory of what's there. and and with the subsequent analysis that you can do, you can identify by subtraction what isn't there. And so we will be able to answer that question. Uh, I mentioned that we're also working, um, at, again, as a research project with the government, we're, we're working on an eco shoreline plot um, and we're comparing at that site, terracotta versus concrete. And so I suspect there will be some very strong differences between the two of them. And again, using this eDNA method to to resolve that. Uh, the the advantage is, is that if you go, if even you know, even if Steve Hawkins goes to the rocky inner tidal using his two eyes, there he's human. There's only you can only get down to about two millimeters before you can't really identify what an animal is. And the the reality is is that most life is smaller than two millimeters. We're just very biased in our perspective of what we see and appreciate. Um, so when you get down to that little stuff, things get really, really interesting. And, and what that means is that the so-called signal to noise ratio is enhanced, right? So given a, a, a certain number of species, if that pool of species is much larger, your ability to detect differences between materials types or designs is going to be further enhanced. So I see these things being very complementary. Mm. Great. Thank you. Um, so just looking at the chat uh, for any other questions. Uh, I, I had one in, in the meantime, just uh, to, to, to give people time for uh, maybe a, a couple of last questions before we uh, finish up. Um, so, so David, you said you've set up um, the Archie Reef startup. Um, and if we were to start similar projects uh, locally, who is your uh, your client, uh, basically, for, for this type of types and, and, and this type of projects? Yeah, well, we're, we're really working, uh, we have, I'm trying to learn all this business nomenclature, but we really work um, first and foremost with governments and also with corporates. So that's like the B to G or B to C. Um, yeah. business workflow. And, um, you know, we've already had several engagements with our local government. Uh, we've been contacted by a government in the Middle East who's very keen to have us doing a project there. And um, with the B2C, we're really targeting the corporates that are interested in enhancing what they call their ESG 
compliance. So there's a lot of momentum in that area in this part of the world. And I, you know, I'm really impressed by who, who I've talked to. These are people from, you know, finance and uh, tourism industries, but they really know what they're talking about. Uh, so this government framework that's pushing corporates to take up more responsibility for mitigating climate change and so forth is is having a momentum and i'm kind of the timing is actually quite perfect for a startup like archie reef uh, it's a great time for any student uh, of ecology or art to get into this because there's going to be a great demand for it and we need smart people who are doing it the right way and not in an exploitative way you know for example archie reef doesn't sell we don't sell the reef tile to, to anybody it's not a mass produced product it's a, it's bespoke it's it's fit for purpose we deploy it we maintain it we uh make we make sure that it works uh it's a reputational risk to just sell these things to whoever and let them put it however they want on the seabed it just becomes marine debris and part of the problem so you know that's something that's part of our ethics that i think really stems from our knowledge of best practices in, in uh conservation biology Mm. Yeah, that's fantastic. Thanks for, for sharing all that information with us as well. Um, and, uh, and yeah, I guess if there are no other questions, I think we're going to be uh, wrapping up uh, this talk. And again, a uh, massive thank you uh, to you, David, for this uh, absolutely wonderful and super informative presentation uh, for all of you guys who joined uh, the talk i thought i hope you enjoyed it and um and yeah hopefully we keep innovating and see uh, similar uh, technology being uh, implemented uh, locally in plymouth thank you so much for your time and attention and uh, if anyone's interested shoot me an email happy to chat more about it nigel i'm already following you on twitter <laughs> <laughs> thank okay you good night everybody Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.